All right, next I'd like to call on Tony Petrangelo again. Um, we do have a very wide range uh, panel discussion on the lessons learned from Fukushima, and they're going to be looking at it from three distinct perspectives. So, Tony? Okay, good morning again. Uh, this panel discussion this morning, as Dennis said, we've got a diverse trio here. Uh, explore the lessons learned from Fukushima. We've been at this for a while now and see where we stand. Uh, joining us in the panel discussion is Chip Pardee, Chief Operating Officer at Exelon, also chairs our uh, Fukushima Response Steering Committee for the Industry, Bill Borchert, the Executive Director for Operations at the NRC, and Dave Lockbaum, the Director of the Nuclear Safety Project at the Union of Concerned Scientists. So three different perspectives. Uh, on the format of this discussion is a little bit different than we've done in the past, so, and I'm the guinea pig for this experiment. I'm going to have my little think pad up with me. You can email me questions during the panel discussion at questions at nei.org, which should come up on the screen. There you go. Or you can go to the microphone. We'll have folks circulating, uh, to, and you can pose a question to our panel. We want this to be a lively panel discussion, so feel free to weigh in. And we want it to be very, very open. So again, uh, let's make this a lively, interactive discussion. Can we text the answers? <laughs> no. no. Nice try. OK, just to get the juices flowing here. Uh, it's been over a year since Fukushima transpired. Um, just give us your initial thoughts on when the event unfolded, what you were thinking about, especially that first week, what was kind of running through your mind as, as we watched that unfold, Chip? Well, it, it, my reaction, you know, when this first started, I can remember within a day or so actually going to NEI, I might have needed to go there for some other uh, purpose, but I can remember sitting there and watching the events and, and in essence saying, I, I think it'll be under control until uh, probably the second day. And then it became clear to me and everyone else in the discussion, I think, that uh, this was going to be very different. And of course, I think you know, everyone in the room has that indelible in image of the reactor buildings exploding. And uh, you know, even today, when I see those film clips replayed, I, I just find it astonishing that, that, uh, that the consequences of this could be as dramatic as they were. So I clearly made the uh, evolution over perhaps a 36-hour period of this is going to be a challenge, but th they'll have it well in hand to this is something that's going to change the complexion of our business. Right. Dave, how about you? Very similar response. Uh, I was in Washington for the NRC's Regulatory Information Conference, scheduled to leave Friday morning, but because of the accident, stayed for a while. And like Chip, I thought as time passed that that was going to work in, in advance, you know, whatever risk there was, it was lessening with time. So I actually left about 5 p.m. on Friday and then saw the building explode Saturday morning. And that's, that was the lowest point in my professional career. Even things that were my fault didn't go down that far um, because it, it, it was a failure everywhere, not just that. So it, it gave me a dimension. And the info report that came out last October helped provide some insight as to the infrastructure damage that I had no inkling was causing some of those outcomes. So that was very helpful in filling in some of those gaps. Mm -hmm. Bill? Yeah, as soon as we got uh, word on the, of the earthquake, we had uh, two issues. One was uh, we uh, manned our operations center. The initial concern had to do with uh, domestic licensees, really materials licensees, not so much the West Coast reactors, but Hawaii and the US territories. There's regulated materials licensees in those uh, territories that we had some initial concern. So we went on tsunami watch, actually. Another aspect, though, was because of the Reg Info conference here, we had some uh, Japanese regulatory counterparts uh, in the country, and so we were trying to use our operations center to help them make the connections and to facilitate uh, dialogue with uh, Japan on that. Uh, over the weekend, as the situation got incredibly worse, we shifted from, the, and the tsunami didn't turn out to have any impact, we 
shifted a little bit into uh, radiation monitoring because there was concern about what kind of plume was going to hit, again, the U.S. territories in the Pacific as well as Alaska and the West Coast. Uh, but it wasn't very soon after, really, the beginning of that next week that we realized that this was going to be a major international incident. And, uh, it was already by Sunday that we had uh, NRC staff going to Japan to work out of uh, the embassy. And, and we had an NRC presence for almost a year in Japan, as many as 12 people for the majority of the year providing assistance. So it was obviously going to be a long haul uh, once we got through that first weekend. Yeah, even for me, the, especially when we saw the, uh, the IMPO report on the, the chain of events, the human element of that was what struck me the most, is, is how they struggled to cope with that event in that first 24 hours, and then to have the explosion was just uh, totally debilitating. All right, so now we've been at this for a year. Chip, we meet every month and talk weekly, if not more frequently. From a resource perspective for your fleet of plants, how are you balancing the need to respond to what the NRC is requiring us to do and to keep the focus on uh, current plant operations? Well, I think that is a, uh, will remain a relevant question for us for some time. We, uh, to your point, have spent a lot of time with the industry, with our regulators, with various stakeholders in shaping our response, and including uh, participation from non-governmental organizations and such. Uh, one of the real strengths of our system is, is the checks and balance and the open environment in which you know, things like the response to Fukushima are debated. But we really are not at the point yet where this has been a significant resource challenge for the folks that we are really most concerned about, and that are, are the operating crews at the stations and such. So we're right at the cusp with these recent sets of uh, orders and uh, proposed regulatory changes and some of the voluntary initiatives that the industry has taken on where the corrective actions or, or the improvement actions have been shaped and they are just now being promulgated to the station. So I think very high on all of our lists of concerns is how do we balance these improvement efforts with uh, the, the already challenging day-to-day uh, operating responsibilities that the crews have. And it's interesting, this event uh, has many parallels to our reaction from the events of 9-11, but there are a couple of very significant differences. One, 9-11, unlike what we saw at Fukushima, was something that I think by and large we had not contemplated in, in, as an industry. We, didn't, we hadn't sat and thought through uh, the prospect or the, the extreme damage that could be created by using, in the case of 9-11, commercial aircraft as weapons. In the case of Fukushima, while we have spent and will continue to spend a lot of time uh, evolving our knowledge of things like seismic response, these are not uncontemplated things. To counter that, however, the responses, or, or our response from 9-11 largely left the operating crews unaffected. It was our security specialists, it was the engineers looking at our defensive barriers and such. And while the operating crews do in fact have responsibilities today uh, as a consequence of 9-11 that they did not have a decade or a little more than a decade ago, um, they were largely left to running the power plants, which is as we would expect their focus. This set of, of improvement activities uh, will not be the same way. So we are, you know, as, as you know, as is pretty much part of every public dialogue that we have, our principal goal is to make sure we don't somehow inadvertently disrupt that focus on quality operations as we implement these improvement actions. Bill, the NRC has a resource challenge as well with this, don't you? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I think uh, Chip made the point that, uh, that I'd like to just reinforce. I think everyone appreciates the fact that the safe operation of the 104 operating reactors has to be the number one priority. I'm actually quite proud of the work that the NRC did and really from the very outset of separating the Fukushima response activities from our normal response, domestic responsibility for the 104 reactors. So we were able to accommodate all of this emergent work, all this new activity, all the support to Japan without uh, having any sacrifices to our reactor oversight program. 
right? So that, that was a good separation of functions and we were able to accomplish that and I, th I think that's a good thing. The, uh, the other piece I think that we need to be mindful of and following up on what Chip was talking about is uh, we are going to be, and we already have, put new requirements onto the industry. There's orders, the requests for information, there's rulemakings that we've initiated, and there's going to be findings that come out of, of these reviews. There will be discrepancies and deficiencies identified. The corrective action for that needs to be integrated with everything else that we have underway. So we recognize that it has to be a holistic approach to the corrective action program. The fact that an issue can be tied to the Fukushima event doesn't make it, in my mind, necessarily more safety or risk significant than any other finding. And that will be a challenge because there's a, uh, there's a political aspect to having Fukushima tag on an issue that uh, we need to make sure is uh, counterbalanced with the proper risk and uh, safety perspective. Okay. Okay. And Dave, you've seen what the NRC's come out with in terms of uh, orders, requests for information. We've gone through this process for about a year now. See any gaps in, in what we're doing thus far? Well, I, I think there's three areas that I'd highlight. One is, as Bill pointed out, on the day of Fukushima, the NRC looked very diligently at non-power reactor threats in addition to the power reactor threats. In reading the transcripts, it's amazing how many questions were asked and answered before the tsunami reached U.S. shores. That's very commendable. Um, what we don't see is that since then, it's 14 months since that, there's plans in place and steps in place to deal with the power reactor, Fukushima lessons learned. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to deal with the decommissioning reactors, the research and test reactors, the nuclear materials licensees that have lessons to be learned, not the same lessons, but the, right. so we, we think that's overdue and those mm -hmm. things need to be identified and no steps taken. The second, it deals with the containment vents. On boiling water reactors, the normal gaseous effluents are filtered. Under normal accidents, the gaseous effluents are filtered. It makes no sense not to filter the gaseous effluents during severe accidents. Basically, you're telling the public that if we lose our reactor, we're taking your community down with it. That's really not the right message to be sent to those communities. So it, the fact that that's even a debate is disturbing to us. The third is more of a, a surprise observation I've had. From talking to NRC staff and industry representatives over the last year, I'm amazed how many say that Fukushima is proof that spent fuel pools are basically invulnerable to hazards. Um, I've heard that more often, once was too many, but I've heard it a lot. And I don't think that's the lesson we learned from Fukushima. But for the hydrogen explosions, the ability to put water into those spent fuel pools would have been challenging. So I think, but for something that we don't want to see replicated again, blowing up buildings to protect the spent fuel pools. So I don't think that was the lesson that we learned from that experience. I'm, I'm shocked that so many industry people and NRC staffers seem to have drawn that conclusion from that accident. Let me pull the string a little bit on the filtered vent question. We just sent a letter into the agency. We've looked at it a little bit. Um, from our perspective, trying to put a filter on the end of a vent pipe outside of containment may not be the place to start that discussion, that there's other means of scrubbing, a containment spray, flooding, et cetera, that can scrub any potential release. Should we study this holistically or just put a filter on the end of a vent? I'm glad you asked that question because we're not predetermining what the right answer is. Right. To me, it should be a performance-based standard. You want to reduce what goes out that pipe or that pathway to some fraction of what it was before. Mm -hmm. However it's done, that's fine. But it, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the HEPA filters and charcoal filters. But at the end of the day, whatever pathway, whatever mechanism is used, you need to have that reduction in, in what's going out, the source term reduction. Mm -hmm. So we're not pre-designing or presupposing what that okay. answer is, but not to do that is the wrong answer. Right. Okay. Bill, you, you led the uh, U.S. delegation to the uh, March meeting in Vienna, Fukushima meeting. Uh, where does the U.S. stand relative to other countries in implementing lessons learned? The, uh, the U.S. reaction has, uh, is right in line, I think, with the rest of the international community from a lot of respects. But I think there's two things I'd like to identify that are unique to the U.S. situation, at least in my eyes. One is a lot of actions, a lot of equipment was installed as a result of 
I think the U.S. did more than most other countries around the world in response to 9-11. That equipment, much of it, is just as useful in response to a natural external hazard event as it was to the kinds of events that they were originally installed to prevent. So uh, we started off, I believe, in a slightly better position than many other countries. Uh, the uh, second thing that I think is, uni is unique to the United States situation is that the, uh, the uh, cooperation and coordination within the U.S. industry uh, affords the opportunity to provide resources and cooperation that you don't see in many other countries. Uh, even the large uh, countries are usually one operating company. Here, th through the efforts of INPO and, and NEI and, and other uh, operator groups, uh, there, are, uh, there exists the ability to pull on resources and talent and equipment that um, is more responsive, I think, than other countries. So, so that's kind of background. To, to see what uh, we've done as a result of the near-term task force evaluation that the NRC did, the 12 recommendations, and now heading down the path to implementing corrective actions, I see is uh, entirely consistent with the rest of the world. The, much of the world is using the term stress tests, which uh, is a little bit of a confusing term in my view. It was really a, an analysis of uh, the, the threat to external hazards and what equipment was available and what might need to be done in order to enhance its uh, survivability. That's the very similar to the same kind of things that we're doing. So I, I don't see big differences. There have been a number of international meetings at the uh, IAEA uh, to cross-pollinate ideas, if you will. Uh, we benefited, uh, the loss of ultimate heat sink was an issue that received more visibility in the international community that we, than what we came up with originally. So we benefited from that interaction by adding that topic to our agenda. There will be this August a, uh, what's being called an extraordinary meeting of the Convention on Nuclear Safety. This is a, a convention uh, that uh, has every operating uh, reactor country in the world that uh, participate in. And the purpose of this one week meeting will be to discuss and share the uh, findings of all of these peer reviews or our near-term task force reviews and the actions being taken. And that'll be another opportunity to cross-calibrate uh, across the world. Okay. Dave, if you want to weigh in. I just want to add a little bit to what Bill said. We, we agree that some of the actions that was taken in this country after 9-11 gives us the luxury of time. We, we have the luxury of taking the time to get it right rather than just get it done fast. To add to that is some of the other things that were done after 9-11 was to, to look at some of these security exercises that are performed periodically to look at hostile actions. So our response capabilities, we upped our game on response capabilities since 9-11, and that adds to the, the luxury of time I think we have to get this right rather than just to meet some arbitrary schedule. Yeah, I agree with Dave that 9-11 you know, forced us to build ties with local law enforcement, the Department of Homeland Security, you know, that myriad of off-site resources that, you know, we may not have had constructive relationships prior to, and it's clear from Fukushima that that off-site response capability is going to be key to our continue to reinforce the robustness of, of our responsiveness. So there are a lot of things that, that may be indirect but very valuable as an outcome. Okay. All right, we've got our first electronic question. Um, while we're learning from the, the failures at Fukushima Daiichi, actually Fukushima Daini was a successful mitigation effort. Uh, why didn't Daini, why didn't the Daini plant uh, lose AC power and they had four operators react, uh, operating at the time of the uh, earthquake and, and tsunami chip? Can you shed some light there? Yeah, we, um, to your point, we have spent a fair amount of time looking for lessons learned extracted from success as well as the lessons learned extracted from the tragic consequences of the tsunami and the, and the uh, impacts of the, the reactor accidents. Um, from a technical point of view, 
It, it appears that Fukushima Daini, which was something on the order of 10 kilometers away from Fukushima Daiichi, but still exposed to a very significant tsunami, never entirely lost all of its AC power sources. And they had the electrical in interconnects and uh, the operators had the, the ability to cross-connect sufficient buses, electrical buses, post-tsunami uh, post uh, in order to maintain those critical safety functions. They had the, the AC electrical power to do that, provide a form of core cooling and protect their containments. Um, they have uh, a decision-making structure there that is different than ours and appears to have been successful at Daini. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to reflect upon Daiichi's because, again, the technical challenges were different at Daiichi. But, you know, clearly those that were in charge of making decisions at Daini site uh, were successful in directing the operators to provide those safety functions. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. I'll open this one up to the panel. Uh, Chairman Yasko brought up socioeconomic impacts of nuclear events. There is day to day socioeconomic benefit, too, that he didn't mention, but perhaps the panel could comment on realism of this concept, as well as whether the NRC or any other government regulator should expand its role in this regard. Bill, I'll do that yeah, up to you first. I'll just uh, skirt the issue, the real question, because we have uh, under preparation a commission paper that is going to address uh, kind of the, uh, the current situation in the area of economic consequences and land contamination. This is obviously a very significant policy issue that we're going to present uh, to the Commission. This first paper, I expect, will do not much more than just kind of uh, lay the groundwork for uh, an understanding of what the current situation is, what's the current regulatory basis, what's the current foundation of law that gives NRC authority or not have authority in this area. And then we'll expect to get direction from the commission on how they would like us to proceed uh, regarding future regulatory actions uh, in this area. So it has major implications, as you can imagine, for all sorts of emergency preparedness activities and cost uh, benefit analyses. Uh, I should, though, say that we do evaluate this general area in many license amendments to a certain degree, but whether it goes to the extent to, uh, to which the chairman was referring, um, that's what we need to explore. Okay. Dave? I guess we come at it from a slightly different perspective. This was something we actually started developing before 9-11 and continuing to, to polish and evolve. And we call it a short list approach. If you postulate some bad thing happening, there's almost always a list of things you do to prevent the next recurrence of that bad thing. We look at that short at list, and if it's short enough, then you can reasonably say you did everything you, you reasonably could to protect that, but it happened anyway. If that's a long list of things, then there's probably things on that list that you should be doing now. So we would apply that to Fukushima. The, that doesn't satisfy all the legal and other niceties that you necessarily have to do once you identify some things on the list that need to be done. Mm -hmm. But at least that's the scrubbing we give to see whether something should or should not be done. If it's happened and it's automatically you take it to prevent the next one, then you might ought to consider doing that to prevent the first one as well. Okay. I think it's important, though, to recognize that the direction that we're heading in, the industry, the regulatory um, implications of these orders and, and uh, requests for information and such will, in fact, you know, yield very positive benefits to prevent those negative socioeconomic implications. I mean, we had been focusing on preventing any kind of uh, significant core meltdown or release in the first place, and that, in fact, in our view, is the high-class way to address this. I don't mean to imply that there aren't other things that we may end up contemplating as as you and Dave talked about, we are looking at ways that we could use uh, some of the flex equipment that we've described to provide a filtering function for whatever release is occurring from primary containment. So we are looking at this, but it's not that this is, this is a question that's not being attended to by the actions that we have underway already. And I think it's some balance that we'll have to continue to, to focus on. Could, I just A couple of things we're looking at to try to to provide incentives to make that happen is either get a break on liability insurance, because if you implement measures to reduce the likelihood that stuff gets out, 
there, there should be some payback for them. I, I do it in my homeowner's policy with locks and other things. Right. So it seems like if there's a better containment device or better mechanism, there should be some payback in terms of reduced liability insurance. The other aspect, the other way to prop tackle the same thing might be in risk-informed regulation. If you come up with something that reduces your risk profile at a site, there should be some benefit associated with that, some reason for doing it, something to offset the cost of improving that. Right now, there's really not that. The, right. the social, whatever that's called, the, those things are a penalty to reward that. Maybe the other side is provide a, a reward still with the same risk-reward outcome. Right. Okay, another electronic question here. Um, now, Chip, earlier you talked about potential distraction of plant operators. Bill noted it as well. Obviously, we've got a lot of attention focused on implementation of the requirements that have come out of Tier 1. But the Commission's about to get a paper on the Tier 2 and 3 activities in July. Chairman Yatsko mentioned that earlier. And I have to refresh my screen. Um, is that too fast for us to deal with uh, in dealing with generic regulatory issues while we're implementing this? Can we handle this? Do we have the bandwidth? Ooh. Well, um, we don't know what the this is yet. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, my impression is it's not too early to be considering Tier 2 and Tier 3. We may find, in fact, that we can uh, quickly yield some of the benefits associated with uh, the activities that are underway today and perhaps address the Tier 2 and Tier 3 uh, concerns bef you know, b before they go through the entire analytical process. I think it would be a big mistake to think that because we have prescribed the activities associated with Tier 1, that means we're able to now start tackling the improvement actions associated with two, Tier 2 and Tier 3. I, right. you know, m my opinion is, and I think it's one that's shared broadly, is we have bitten off what we can chew right now, and we also think clearly it's the activity that will by far yield the most significant safety improvements. So uh, I, I don't think that there is um, a, a, a falsity to the logic to say we have the right stuff that we're dealing with right now. We have to make sure we do it right. We have to do it uh, not at the expense of, of uh, the quality of our current operations and tier, and tier, tier two and tier three activities as we look at them and we evaluate what they're safety benefits are, I, I, I think they will come in due time. Bill? Yeah, the, uh, well, the Commission has uh, clearly accepted the idea of cumulative effects of regulation being a, a topic that uh, we want to consider as we impose any new requirements. I mean, it's, it's obviously a very important uh, concept and it uh, reinforces the idea of taking a holistic view at safety and security. However, I think we need to keep driving ourselves toward resolving some of the issues. There's, uh, I use as an example the station blackout rule. If, if there was any lesson that I'd learned and we heard in the earlier presentations, uh, having AC power is probably one of the most important lessons learned out of uh, the accident in Fukushima. So the station blackout rule needs to be addressed. There are a number of reasons why we should take longer than 24 months to do uh, the station blackout rule. But there are more valid reasons, in my mind, why we need to plan and progress and try to get a revised rule out. If it's not perfect, we can revise it again. We can make it a little bit better in the, in the second step. We shouldn't let uh, perfection be the enemy of uh, good. And we uh, need to make the rule more robust and more effective and we can, we can do that through uh, the established process. So I, I think, you know, is there, there is a lot on our plate. We're willing to interact and have meetings to understand what the impact will be of imposing any new requirement. But it shouldn't be an excuse for not making any progress. Right. Dave? There's a couple of things we don't, it's hard for us to judge the resources and weather distractions, but a couple of things we're banking on to, to guard against pace being too quick. As Bill talked about, the formation of the Japanese directorate within the agency, that will help these issues be addressed without distracting the agency's other important activities. So that's a very commendable thing. We've got provides protection against the NRC being driven at too fast a pace at consequence of the operating reactors. For the industry, if the resources become too 
too much or too distracted, we think the reactor oversight process will flag, hopefully will flag that performance decline before it gets too deep and too broad. So we think th what the NRC's organizational changes we've made, coupled with the reactor oversight process for the industry, provide us protection against going too fast at pace or earning unintended consequences from that. Okay. We've got about five minutes left. Let me kind of give a last question here uh, to, to close this out. What does success look like when we're done with, with implementing the Fukushima lesson plan? How long does it take? What does it look like? Provide some granularity here from each of your perspectives. Jeff? I think success for us will be defined by, and, and I, I realize we all are continue to circle back to the ensuring that we don't disrupt you know, the current operations of the power plant. So clearly, you know, our, my principal first success goal would be that that doesn't occur as we work our way through all these. Secondly, that we do in fact confirm that the external threats within our design bases are properly protected against. We spent a lot of time talking today about seismic robustness and protection against flooding events and such. You know, those activities that are clearly within our licensing bases um, are, are properly analyzed and if we make, have to make any adjustments to physical protection uh, attributes and such th that we make those. Third, that this beyond design bases approach to improve our defense in depth, we commonly call it flex, but our ability to react on a symptomatic basis to those things that we did not contemplate that aren't part of our current licensing bases is done correctly and in a relatively quick time frame. So we've used the five-year timeline. I think we're going to come pretty close as long as we stay on the course that we're on right now. So I think five years is about the right time frame. I don't think it serves any of the stakeholders, industry, the regulator, the public, uh, for this to lag much beyond that. And lastly, that in the course of all this, we, the industry, are investing sufficiently with our stakeholders, our elected officials, the communities in which we live, the state governments, you know, the public at large, in re-engaging with that dialogue to make sure uh, those that, um, it, it, for which it is important that we're successful understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and are proceeding forward with us with confidence because there is a trust basis established and the facts are flowing freely. So right. those are the four things that I would say defi will define whether we're successful, Tony. Dave? Well, I think I, I'm not smart enough to know if five years or 10 years is the right time frame. I have a, don't have a crystal ball, it's more like a bowling ball in that regard. But I think at the end of the day, when, when the resolution is done and we close the chapter on Fukushima lessons learned, I think we should be able to look back and say there was no undue delays. I know that's also like beauty, it's in the eye of the holder. I think the example we throw forward is, is when something was resolved with no undue delay was the industry and the NRC's managing, uh, the managing gas accumulation and piping issue. If you look at that, we thought the industry did a great job. We think the NRC did a great job. There was some work done at risk. There was some done work that was postponed because some answers needed to be done. I thought that was commendable. I also recognize we didn't have any role in that, so I don't know if there's a lesson learned. If we stick out of it, you do a better <laughs> job. Um, but that's not what we drew from that. But if we can look back on this Fukushima lessons learned, like the managing gas accumulation, I think that'd be success. Okay. Bill, how about you? Yeah, I'll uh, answer in, uh, in a process way, and then uh, I have a couple things that I think are the most important of all of the activities that we have underway. One is a uh, process. Uh, we cannot do anything through all this that impacts the safety of operating reactors. And we've said it uh, a number of times already uh, this morning, but it can't be said uh, too many times. The, uh, the second is that the process needs to have some discipline, that we can't allow um, every good idea that comes into somebody's mind to get put under the Fukushima umbrella and to be given a, uh, an appropriate high priority. So there needs to be a discipline to use the correct process. If it really is Fukushima related, we'll include it. Uh, if it's not, we have other processes, generic issue programs, other ways to address uh, issues. That uh, third, we need to do it right uh, uh, the first time and not redo it. I mean, this goes to having a, a hard driving schedule, but we shouldn't let quality be sacrificed in order to make, uh, make some kind of a schedule. And then fourth on the process front is that uh, there needs to be active stakeholder engagement. And from the NRC perspective, 
That means with the public, uh, that means with uh, elected officials uh, around the nuclear plants, and it means with the industry so that we understand the impacts of emerging regulatory requirements. On the technical front, my top four are uh, station blackout. Uh, the second is the integration of emergency planning programs, the uh, uh, you know, emergency operating procedures, the, the extensive damage guidelines and the SAMGs. Uh, the third is to have uh, in place a process that looks at the true uh, external hazards and our ab ability for the U.S. reactors to respond to that and when appropriate that they get updated throughout time, that the, we shouldn't have to wait for an event to update it. It ought to be done as the need arises. And then th the fourth uh, item, which I think is going to be the longest lasting impact generations from now for the, is the regulatory framework, the recommendation number one uh, out of the near-term task force report that looks at how the regulatory footprint for all of the things that have been Band-Aid approaches over the last 25, 30 years will be pulled together into uh, one integrated package. I think that will have the longest term impact on the uh, U.S. industry out of everything that we've talked about. It is an urgent thing, so it's not getting the top priority right now, but I think it'll be the longest lasting. Well, we certainly look forward to that discussion. Uh, <laughs> I want to apologize for those questions that I couldn't get to and the amount of time we had. Please join me in thanking the panel for the discussion.